Yeah. Yeah, I want to I want to lead the discussion to some of the beauty of it. Yes, exactly. The, yeah. the beauty yeah. and the complexity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for coming, and of course also to to George Monbiot. It's a, it's a huge pleasure to have him back. George is a fellow of the college, and it's it's fantastic to see him again, despite having moved to Devon. Um, so George needs no introduction. I don't want to waste time on that. Um, but um, just while I'm sitting here, I'm a professor of geophysics and, and a governing body uh, fellow of the college. And um, with geophysics, you might think I, I know a lot about these topics, but not really. I'm only scratching the surface of soil. But I think just as myself, for all of us, it's really important to dive a bit deeper into all of these topics, literally. So um, with that, I just wanted to start with a few basic, um, basic questions and then have three or four categories. And within each of these categories, open the floor to questions from the audience. But um, at the very first moment, I wanted to, to ask George, um, so why, why should we be interested in a, in a, in a foot deep of dirt um, when we've sort of managed to, to feed ourselves more or less over thousands of years? Mm -hmm. And how does it connect maybe in particular with an Oxfordshire farmer and the three wise men from Shropshire? <laughs> <laughs> so... You could travel all over the world visiting rainforests and coral reefs, but you would be hard put to find a more fascinating ecosystem than the one beneath our feet. It's just that everything's pretty small, so you need a lens. But once you start digging, literally, into this extraordinary thing which we call soil, you begin to realise that well, it's as abundant, as diverse in terms of its life forms as any other ecosystem, and in some ways, even more complex than a rainforest or a coral reef. Now, it might seem strange that I'm talking of soil as, as an ecosystem, but, but that, is, that is what it is. If it were just stuff, there would be no such thing as soil, because it would be immediately swept off the land by the first rainstorm or by the first wind. Because it's not just a, um, a, a collection of organisms, it's a biological structure. Soil is created by the creatures that live in it in exactly the same way that a coral reef is, or for that matter, a rainforest. Um, and uh, looking at the, the smallest scale, if we start with, with bacteria, for instance, uh, bacteria create these tiny little capsules, they're called microaggregates, in, in, in which they live. And they use the organic carbon in the soil as um, cement. They turn it into polymers with which they stick the little mineral particles together to make these tiny homes for, for themselves, these little nests for themselves, which have remarkable properties. So even when you air dry soil, it's 98% humidity inside those little aggregates which the bacteria create. And then out of those bacterial aggregates, the uh, microarthropods, the little scuttling creatures in the soil, a lot of which you can see with a jeweler's loop. If you get one of these five pound, 40 times magnification jeweler's loops and start looking at soil at the right time of year, April or May is good, especially if the soil's a bit damp, when things are warming up, you, you, you dig up a lump of soil and it will just burst into life under that lens and you'll see it's absolutely stuffed with with little mites and springtails and cone heads and bristle tails and and a whole range of things that you never knew existed including entire phyla that you probably didn't know existed you will see more of the major branches of life in a fistful of soil than you would in a fortnight safari in the serengeti it, it's it's just amazing how it opens up and these microarthropods and other little tiny creatures in the soil turn those um, micro aggregates into what are called meso aggregates middle-sized clumps so they use the clumps that the bacteria have made to make their own homes their own clusters within the soil and then the giants of the soil things we can see with the naked eye such as ants and worms they then turn those meso-aggregates into macro-aggregates. And soil is fractally scaled. In other words, it has the same structure regardless of the level of magnification. And that fractal scaling gives it tremendous structural resilience. That's what holds it together. That's what enables what just looks like a mass of stuff, but is actually highly structured until we've smashed it all up through ploughing and stuff but in nature is a highly structured ecosystem that's what keeps it 
on the land. And it's in fact by either destroying the structure or by destroying the organisms which create the structure, that's how you destroy soil. That, that's what leads to soil degradation and, and loss. And there's lots of different ways of doing that, over ploughing, over fertilising, sometimes over irrigating. There's all sorts of ways in which you can either destroy the life forms or destroy the structure directly, which can then lead to the eventual collapse of that complex system, of that ecosystem. And that collapse is something we call a dust bowl. And what tends to happen is that you undermine and undermine the resilience of this system until it approaches a tipping point, and then you just need an external shock, such as a major drought, and it will suddenly collapse. It'll collapse from one equilibrium state, which is basically there and functioning, into another equilibrium state, which is not there. There goes Oklahoma. You know, it's gone. And, and once it's gone, well, soil forms at the rate of about one centimetre per thousand years. So in human terms, it's gone forever, effectively. Now, the... The way in which plants engage with soil is an absolutely fascinating and complex issue which we're only just beginning to get to grips with. And it's only really been in the past 10 years or so that uh, our understanding has, has flowered in terms of what is going on when plant roots push through a clump of soil. And in its current state, it's roughly this, that... When a root hair of a growing plant pushes into a, a lump of soil um, for, for the first time, the first thing it does is it starts to talk. And that might sound strange, but it turns out that plants have a very sophisticated language. And it's a chemical language expressed in what are called exudates, which are the chemicals released by the root. And, and the first thing it wants to do is to single out particular microbial species from the huge number which might be in that lump of soil but generally exist in a state of dormancy, most of which are bacteria, but there's all sorts of other things as well there, but bacteria of particular interest, by sending a signal which only that species can hear. And it can be so specific that in some cases a plant can talk to a genotype of a bacterial species, but not to other genotypes within the same species. It's such a specific signal. And these are tremendously complex chemicals, which are very expensive to make for the plant. Uh, you know, chemical names this long. And, and what it's doing is sending out an alarm signal, effectively saying, you, wake up. No, not you, not you, not you. You, that particular one, you wake up. And, and in response to that signal, that bacterial species will wake up and say, oh, yeah, what? and then the plant will flood it with sugar. And roughly between, well, the range is between 10% and 40% of all the sugars that plants make from photosynthesis, they release into the soil. And at first sight, you might think, well, they're just pouring money down the drain. It doesn't seem to make any sense. But what they're doing is allowing those favoured bacteria to multiply around the root hair to form some of the densest bacterial colonies on, on Earth. And in doing so, they form what we call the rhizosphere, the zone of influence immediately surrounding the, the, the root hair. And they then deliver several absolutely essential services to that plant. One is that in return for the sugars, they deliver minerals to the plant. So it's a symbiotic relationship, pretty similar again to what's going on in, in, a, in a coral reef. And, um, and, and plants can, can extract very few of the minerals they need themselves. They need bacteria or fungi or other microbes to get into the tiny crevices, to use their enzymes to release minerals, deliver them to, to, to the plant. But they also create a defensive ring around the root, fighting off pathogens which might attack it. And they have the function of firing up the plant's immune system. So even if the plant is being attacked above ground by aphids or caterpillars, for example, it'll send a signal down into the root, out through the root, to the bacteria in the rhizosphere surrounding the root, and then the bacteria will modify that signal and bounce it back. And then the plant will be better equipped to produce the secondary metabolites to fight off those aphids or, or those caterpillars. Now, it seems like a really clumsy way of stimulating your immune system, but that's the evolutionary pathway. You can't shortcut it. 
can't, can't cut, cut the corner. And when you think of those three functions, you know, delivering nutrients, forming a defensive ring, firing up the immune system, is there a faint bell going off in the back of your mind? It's a very, very dense bacterial community with those three functions. Same things are happening in the human gut. You know, where, where the, the bacteria in our gut, our gut flora, are delivering nutrients, they're, they are um, defending the gut wall against pathogens, and they're bouncing back immune signals, um, um, which help us to, to, to fight off pathogens elsewhere in, in the body. What the rhizosphere is, is in effect the plant's external gut. It's in the soil, it's outside the plant, but it's functioning in, in a very similar way. To, to the mammalian gut. To, to drive this home a, a little bit further, there are roughly 1,000 phyla of bacteria on Earth, major groups. In the human gut, it's dominated by four particular phyla. In the rhizosphere, it's dominated by four particular phyla. They're the same four phyla. So we've got already these tremendously complex relationships. But we have scarcely scratched the surface of what's going on beneath the surface. Um, uh, uh, three years ago, I think now, there was a paper published whose authors said, we think we know what soil now is. We're not quite sure, but we, we got a rough idea that we think we know what it is. It's a fascinating paper, um, um, Soil as a Composite Extended Phenotype of the Microbial Metagenome. I'm sure you've all read it. Um, <laughs> but it's... It, and, and what it shows, and their subsequent work has shown even more, is, is a, a collective response um, by what they call the metagenome, which is the, 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 the sort of collated genome of all the microbes in the soil, which seem to operate almost as a body. So as soil carbon declines, the um, length of DNA shrinks right across the entire genome of all the microbes. But at the same time, the number of RNA operons rises, suggesting a metabolic response. And it's the other way around when soil carbon rises again. There's something very, very weird going on, and we're not sure what it was. Well, a couple of years after they published that paper, I caught up with the authors of it, and they said, in the light of new research, we really don't know what soil is. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So I think we've got a very good glimpse and probably the most concise description of the complexity and also the beauty of soil. So um, as a simple physics mind, I sort of want to um, start thinking about very simple concepts like forces and the balance of forces. And I mean, there's one balance already in the title. How do we balance you know, the food provision and the problem of, of really feeding um, the planet in a just, a just, a just way um, with, without destroying you know, the soil and, and everything around it? So um, my first question is, is um, despite the complexity you've, you've alluded to and that, that we, we sort of scarcely start to understand, we have to think beyond that. And that is all the crunching problems around soil. So one is, we of course have biodiversity loss, we have the climate crisis, but um, more importantly, I think we have limitations on space and time. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of where I want to talk about the basic physics concept. So could you, could you sort of summarize um, the problems with space mm -hmm. uh, surrounding soil and our treatment of the soil, yeah, yeah. especially in the last few decades? So we, we really are looking at you know, a few inches between rock and air on which the entirety of human civilization and all terrestrial life depends. This, this weird cushion of something, we're not quite sure what it is, but this strange sort of light structure which, which just exists between these two spheres on which everything depends. 99% of our calories come from the soil and yet we treat it like dirt. You know? and, and here we are uh, ripping it apart like there's no tomorrow and ensuring in doing so that there will be no tomorrow. You know, it's about as, as, as guaranteed as you can get that if you trash the world's soil, there will be no further subsistence for us or, or for other terrestrial life forms. And, and the, the, the rate of degradation is, is quite extraordinary, um, particularly in, in the world's poorest nations, we're seeing a, a rise of soil degradation of 11% per year. Um, uh, and, and it's now reaching the point where it's seriously inhibiting food production across 
very large, large tracts of the planet. In fact, one of the major reasons why sub-Saharan Africa hasn't undergone this, this very rapid aggregate rise in yields, which has been seen in the rest of the world, has been the extreme soil degradation there. And that's partly because exposed soils in the tropics are far more vulnerable than they are in temperate countries because the rain is much harder, the environmental events are much bigger, and so they're more likely to be stripped off the land. But it's also because um, very impoverished people are often driven to farm in very marginal situations, to plough steep slopes, for instance, um, where, where there's more likely um, to, to be grave damage done, done to the soil. We're very lucky in countries like the UK, where our soils are pretty robust and our weather until recently has been pretty mild. Uh, but even so, we're doing our best to catch up with countries where the impacts are more severe, um, particularly by, by concentrating on certain crops. So, so I mean, all, all forms of human intervention in the soil are, are damaging, you know, and the same with any ecosystem, but some are a lot more damaging than others. Um, and, you know, one of the most the stupidest and, and, and most damaging trends of all in, in the UK has been a switch to, to maize production on a large scale. And some of this is for dairy fodder, but um, a, a very rapidly increasing proportion of it is to produce biogas. Now, the promise with biogas was it was going to be using waste materials. It was, it was going to be using sewage or animal slurries, waste food, crop residues, um, all, all those things that we don't want, you would um, uh, pyrolyze it in, a, in an anaerobic digest. Well, you'd, you'd, you'd digest it with bacteria and, and heat in, in an anaerobic digester, um, and you would produce methane, which you could trap, and that would be a good substitute to, for the fossil gas uh, which, which we're using, and that would be a much greener way of heating our homes or cooking our food or whatever we were going to do with it. And then... The, the residue, the digestate, could be used um, for fertiliser and, 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 and spread on the land. But from the outset, that promise of focusing on waste materials was broken. In fact, it's all driven by government incentives, by the way. It's all about subsidies. And the subsidies from the outset were uh, paying for the use of dedicated crops to, to, to make biogas. Um, and in fact, government advice was specifically saying, you know, you will get so much gas if you use maize, so much gas if you use potatoes, so much gas if you use grass silage, for, for instance. Um, and, and so there was this very powerful drive to use dedicated crops. And, and, and in any process, any process will favour dedicated energy sources. Um, one, because... Uh, waste is heterogeneous, it's, it's much, and, and that makes it much harder to handle, and it generally is lower in energy than, than, than your dedicated source. So we've, got, we've ended up, we've drifted into this situation where it's, none of it makes sense. So um, to um, uh, fuel a, a, um, a biogas digester with a capacity of one megawatt, you need between 450 and 500 hectares of, of land. To, to produce the maize to, to feed that. Now, you, can, you, you have a wind turbine with a capacity of one megawatt. It needs one third of, an, uh, one third of a hectare. Uh, it, it's you know, 1,500 times less. It just doesn't make any sense at all in terms of land use. But then when you look at the land that this maize is using, which is generally grades one or two arable land, this is prime land which should be being used to feed us, and then when you look what, at what the maize is doing to that land, it just is utterly nonsensical. So um, the trouble with maize is the rows are very widely spaced, it matures late in the year, it's harvested late in the year, and that means that at all the most vulnerable times, um, late autumn, winter and early spring, the soil is bare and because it's too late to, to put in a second crop. I mean, some people are experimenting now, seeing if they can do so, but it's generally too late to put in a second crop after your maize. So the soil is bare and it just gets stripped off, off the land. And, and as a result of that loss of soil carbon and all the other impacts, almost certainly that biogas has a higher carbon footprint or greenhouse gas footprint than, than the fossil gas that it's supposed to replace. So it, it's these really irrational forms of land use like this which are threatening our future subsistence.
Yes, and I think following up from that, you, you um, talk a lot about the ecological opportunity cost. Mm. I think that's a very interesting and very important concept that's probably really not been brought about that much. Could you sort of briefly describe what you mean, especially, let's say, in, in pasture-fed yeah. uh, uh, animal farming? Yeah. Uh, there's several things which are, have been remarkably neglected yeah. sort of right across all our discussions, our environmental discussions. And one of these things is, is land as an environmental metric. You know, there are so many things that we obsess over, you know, and, and rightly so. You know, we, we should be concerned with the whole range of environmental issues, but there are some which we focus on obsessively, uh, greenhouse gases, for instance, and others which we neglect altogether. And the amount of land we use is, it, on, by any objective measure, an absolutely crucial environmental issue because every hectare of land which we use for our own purposes is a hectare that's not available for wild ecosystems to use if we we have an extractive economy on that land that we've shut off the opportunity for a wild ecosystem to be in that place instead and invariably wild ecosystems are richer in 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 a diversity and abundance of wildlife and richer in carbon than any um, um, extractively used land. Now, there's been a phenomenal amount of nonsense published, greenwash, propaganda, published by the livestock industry, saying we're sequestering carbon and we're creating ecosystems and we're saving the land, including some very popular TED Talks and things. But it's simply wrong. A study by the Oxford Martin School here, um, looking at uh, 300 papers, a, a, it was a review article called Grazed and Confused, um, found, found that um, um, there's not a single case in any of the situations they examined um, of, um, of livestock uh, farming even washing its own face in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because the whole story is we're sequestering carbon in the soil um, but, but the, the methane and the nitrous oxide being produced as well as the process emissions of carbon dioxide from tractors and the rest of it uh, when you put all those together the best case anywhere on earth just compensated for 60% of those emissions in the form of, of carbon sequestration in the soil. Um, and, uh, and in fact, most cases were much, much worse than that. Um, and that is before you take into account the carbon opportunity cost. So you can see like a current account of greenhouse gas emissions and a capital account. And the current account of greenhouse gas emissions might be the flux of methane and carbon dioxide and any carbon that you might or might not be sequestering into the soil balanced against that. Whereas the, the, the capital account um, is to do with how much carbon is in this ecosystem at any one time versus how much carbon might have been in this ecosystem if you hadn't turned it into a cattle pasture. And, and it's always going to be in debt on that capital account because the wild ecosystems have replaced it, even including natural grasslands, ungrazed grasslands or wild herbivore grazed grasslands, will always invariably have more carbon in them than this extractive system which you're using to produce beef or lamb or whatever it might be. Um, and they will invariably be richer in wildlife as well. Uh, you know, a lot of livestock farmers will say, well, we're, we're mimicking nature. Uh, well, it's a very crude caricature if this is mimicking nature. Where are the large predators? Oh, they've all been killed at the behest of li livestock farmers. That is a major drive to kill large predators comes from livestock farming. That's why we don't have wolves and lynx in this country. Um, lions are, and hyenas were a bit... A bit earlier, so we can't really blame livestock farming on that. But, but you know, the wolves and, um, and lynx were driven to extinction large, largely because they ate sheep and 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 cattle and other livestock, um, and they're being persecuted and killed in very large numbers elsewhere in the world, largely because of that. Wild herbivores are, are fenced out on the whole, or they're outcompeted um, by by our domestic herbivores. Where are the trees? You know, in almost all circumstances in, in the UK, there were trees in the landscape, sometimes um, um, continuous cover, sometimes wood pasture. Where are the trees? Um, people talk about re regenerative <coughs> ranching systems, regenerative ranching, formerly known as ranching. Re regenerative is one of those words like sustainable, which just got tacked on to whatever you happen to be doing. But, you know, the most basic component of ecological regeneration is that trees can return to landscapes which were formerly wooded. But 
um, grazing animals selectively browse out tree seedlings because they're very nutritious and very tasty. So um, you have to get down to a really tiny level of livestock before trees can come back. Um, and up till that point, you know, you have this massive ecological opportunity cost, which is what would be there otherwise. Now, the only um, forum in which we really discuss land is when we're talking about urban land and urban sprawl. And we're all rightly concerned about urban sprawl. Cities should be compact. It's good for cities to be compact. Um, and it's good for the countryside if cities are compact as well. So we should be exercised about urban sprawl. But the entire urban area of the planet is, is 1% of its land area. It should be smaller, but that's all, all the homes, all the businesses, all the infrastructure, everything, all the building we've done is 1% of, of the planet. Much of the rest of the planet is ice, it's deserts, uh, it's mountains. Um, some of it, too little, about 30% is, is forests, but that's disappearing very fast in many parts of the world. Um, and um, about 15% seen in the most optimistic uh, metric is protected area. So what about the rest? What about the, the 38% uh, that, 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 that remains? All of that is farming. 38%. It's, it's far more land than all other human uses put together by a very, very long way. Um, and you say, oh, farming, right, that's growing crops, no? And, but yeah, only 12% of the planet's surface is growing crops. And roughly half of that is growing crops to be fed to livestock rather than directly to humans. So what about the remaining 26%, which by itself is more than all other human land uses put together? What's that? That's all pasture primarily for cattle and sheep. And this has a massive carbon and ecological opportunity cost. And so all the celebrity food writers and the chefs and, and even some environmentalists say you should eat pasture-fed meat. They could not be more wrong. It's the most damaging of all foods that we could eat. There was a study done in the United States saying, what if we were to do, as the food writers say we should do, and, and switch from corn-fed beef, which is bad enough to pasture-fed beef. They found that, that the area required to keep cattle would have to rise 270%. So you'd have to cut down all the forests in the United States, you'd have to water all the deserts, you'd have to drain all the wetlands, and you'd have to demolish all the cities, you'd have to degazette all the national parks. You would still have to import most of your beef from Brazil. It's completely senseless. You know, if we had several planets and no room for wild ecosystems on any of them, then maybe we could all eat pasture-fed beef. But as that's not our situation, we should all stop eating pasture-fed beef immediately. Um, and, and so it's, it's this sort of myth which I find myself bumping up against again and again and again and find that things which are just accepted as nostrums, as generally accepted truths, turn out to be completely untrue. And that's nowhere more the case than in the food system. It's, com it's dominated by pictures and by stories when we should be focusing on numbers. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the, the, the case for um, spatial problems is clear. I want to switch over to time. So one of the quotes you have in your book is that um, one paper suggested if food production um, would continue as it is, it would bust the carbon budget, should just greenhouse gas emissions, um, in, the, in the two Celsius um, warming scenario by 2021, even if all the other greenhouse gas emissions were eliminated. So that's an astonishing figure. So I think the case is clear that we have a problem. So I want to make um, the other um, case, and that is if we had the, the magic wand and said, let's all switch to, uh, to, to uh, plant-based diets today, all 8 billion of us. And I, I know it's a problem. We haven't managed to do this in this college, for example. <laughs> but um, let's just say we, we do this. What is sort of, sort of spatial, uh, sort of temporal problem with the soil to actually deal with that? Can we, can we do that? Well, we, we can do that. Because... And how, how long does the soil take to, to actually... Yeah change oh well well so so the first thing to say is if we were all to switch to a plant-based diet and i think actually we can go way beyond mm. switching to a plant-based diet but we'll, we'll come to that but if we were all to switch to a plant-based diet according to um the famous poor and nemechek paper in science um, um, um i think they're both at oxford are they poor uh, anyway but um uh, researchers of this parish um um uh, which which really crunched the numbers on these issues properly and systematically for the first time. They, they found that um, 
not only could you obviously eliminate all the um, need for, for ranching land, so you know, that's straight away 26% um, in the basket, but you could actually reduce the total land required for, for arable production by 19%. And the reason for that is that we're not using... We, while our, our consumption of grain and, and other um, agricultural products would have to rise, um, um, our direct consumption, you're not, you don't require any grain to be feeding to livestock. And so, and 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 the result would be a net reduction, e even in the the ploughed area or the the arable area, um, gr grain producing area of the planet. Now, we definitely still have to find much better ways of of producing that food, even if we were magically all to switch to to a plant based diet tomorrow, because current forms of arable agriculture are often extremely damaging to soil as well as having much wider environmental impacts. Um, the two planetary boundaries which have been crossed furthest are nitrogen and phosphorus uh, and that's primarily because of releases from agriculture. You know, between 50 and 80 percent of all the nitrogen and phosphorus we apply uh, to, to the fields is lost. It's not taken up by plants um, it, it's, it either um, seeps away through the soil, gets into the water, nitrogen, um, will, some of it will be lost to the atmosphere as nitrous oxide, which for powerful greenhouse gases. Um, in, in the water, whether it's fresh water or, or seawater, it causes eutrophication, over fertilization, um, which causes these great blooms of algae. Uh, which might oxygenate the water during the day, but when they respire at night, they deoxygenate the water and can kill virtually everything in it, as we've seen um, with ver ver in very large areas across the planet now, now going on. Um, we also have catastrophes caused by the use of pesticides, particularly by neonicotinoids, which are, are, are such a dangerous pesticide at tiny concentrations. They can just rip through food webs. Everyone talks about bumblebees, but you know, they, what they do in the soil throughout many, many different taxa is absolutely lethal. And you know, they're wiping out the soil organisms which build the soil. And, and then there's loads of other effects down, downstream. So, so we have to change. You know, even if we have just a residue of agriculture, that has to be done very differently. Now, there's several very interesting new approaches um, be, being assayed. And, and well, I think, for me, the, the most exciting of all of them, and you know, I know it's a bit arbitrary to pick one out, but, but it, it is, I find it thrilling, is, is the realisation now of um, a dream that scientists have harboured for over a century, which is to switch to perennial grain crops. Now, almost all the grain we grow, and by grain I mean cereals, oil seeds and pulses, almost all the grain we grow comes from annual crops, pl plants which live and die within one year. Um, and, um, um, and large areas covered by annual plants are, are, are quite rare in nature and always occur in the wake of a disaster. So a major wildfire or a volcanic eruption or a landslide, for instance, which clears all the perennial, the long-lasting plants off the land. And that creates the opportunity for, for annual plants to, to, to sweep in, quickly reproduce, quickly occupy that land and hold it for as long as possible before the perennials come back in and crowd them out. So in order to grow our annual crops, we need to create a disaster every year. And we do so by either ploughing or by spraying the land. We have to kill off all the competing plants, which we call weeds, which would make it hard for those annual plants to establish because they, they really don't like competition, particularly from, from perennials. And then we must pamper the little seedlings as they grow, giving them water, giving them fertiliser, killing the pests with pesticides, killing any more weeds which come in with herbicides all of which has a, a huge environmental impact. But what if we could switch to growing perennial crops, which would last for several years at a time in the soil, and you'd only have to do that once every few years rather than doing it every year. You could radically reduce the environmental impacts. And led by an organisation called the Land Institute in, in Kansas, but with collaboration with several academic um, bodies around the world, uh, there's been this uh, massive 
program to uh, um, uh, screen thousands and thousands of wild plant species as potential candidates for perennial crops, either uh, for their use directly with obviously with selective breeding modification or through hybridization with existing annual crops. And they've had one total success so far, which is a, a strain of rice with the glamorous name of PR23, um, developed in conjunction with Yunnan University in China, which is now fully commercialised. And PR23, it's, it was very simple, it turned out. It was just crossing a short grain rice with a, a wild perennial rice relative, and straight away you had a rice with relatively high yields and just a little bit of selective breeding, and the yields are now the same or slightly higher than those of annual rice. And farmers will bite your hand off to get the seed uh, because it's much less work, much less labour required, and labour's very short now in rural China because so many young people are left for the cities. It also um, greatly reduces the impact of erosion, which is a very big problem in paddy fields because of the amount of ploughing required to, 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 prepare, the, uh, to prepare the site for the crop. Um, and, and so... Uh, and you produce something which is identical to short grain rice. I've eaten it myself, PR23, and it's just short grain rice. It's the same. Um, and, and so that's a, a fully commercialised, fully success, successful perennial grain crop. Um, uh, but there's quite a lot of others in the pipeline, some of which are, are extremely promising. And they have the further property that they tend to be far more environmentally resilient because they put down deeper roots and they've got tougher above-ground structures. So, for instance, the Land Institute is um, d uh, breeding some perennial sunflowers, and it had them next to a block of annual sunflowers. It got hit by a drought, completely wiped out the annuals, and the perennials just sailed through it. So, as well as being more resilient, because they've got deeper roots, they're likely to require less water, less fertiliser, etc. You can see a whole lot of synergies kicking in which mean that you can radically reduce the, the, the impact of producing those crops. Yeah, very, very nice. So I think um, we're at a stage where we kind of got an overview of soil in association with land use, with what we could possibly do. Maybe you have one more um, spark of an idea of what, what uh, other technologies can deliver. Yeah, yeah. I'm I glad guess you I'm asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to get a certain, so so certain by way. far and away, the biggest challenge is to get out of livestock farming. I mean, there are fundamentally two things we've got to do to protect and restore earth systems. One is to leave fossil fuels in the ground. The other is to stop farming animals. It really is as simple as that. If you could do those two things, you've solved the great majority of the problem. The, the rest of it is details beyond that. These are the two things which are hitting earth systems hardest. And arguably, livestock farming hits a wider range of earth systems than, um, than, than even than fossil fuels do. Um, it's primarily because of the, the drive by livestock farming, which is the, the great bulk of the impact that farming is the primary cause of habitat destruction, the primary cause of wildlife loss, the primary cause of species extinction, the primary cause of land use, the primary cause of water use, uh, one of the major causes of water pollution, of air pollution and of, of climate breakdown. Um, it, in fact, livestock alone produce more greenhouse gases than all global transport. Um, and... and you know, it's, it's this system more than anything which is pushing on the boundaries of ecological feasibility, which is pushing us past the point at which Earth systems can, 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 can survive. And getting out of livestock farming, whether it's intensive livestock farming or extensive livestock farming, should be as much a priority as getting out of fossil fuels. And yet it's nowhere to be seen in most environmental discussion. It's been remarkably neglected. I mean, you know, the, uh, the, the COP process really, you know, they had two jobs, you know, to leave fossil fuels in the ground and, and to, stop, to, to stop farming livestock. They haven't even mentioned either of those aims in any declaration from any COP. It's not just a question of not doing it. They haven't even talked about it. And you can't do anything if you're not talking about it. And, and, and so... You know, the, the, this is the great driver, is to, to stop, just stop this horrendous system. I mean, it's a system we, we are very good at not thinking about. 
There was a survey in the United States where over 95% of people eat meat, which found that 47% of people wanted to ban slaughterhouses. Yeah. We're just really good at shutting our minds to the reality of this production. We kill 76 billion farm animals a year to feed ourselves, and the great majority of those are kept in horrendous conditions. I worked as a teenager on an intensive pig farm, and every day there were two thoughts went round my head. One was, this isn't what they told me farming was about. And the second was, why is this legal? You know, if we treated our dogs or cats like we treat pigs, we would literally be sent to prison. And yet we've completely normalised this system and we've normalised the massive environmental impacts that it has. We don't want to go there. We don't want to challenge it. We don't want to apply the same standards that we apply to other industries. So how do you do this? Well, there's all sorts of approaches, including moral suasion, but they'll only take you so far. And one of the major reasons for that is something called Bennett's Law, which is that as, as people become richer... They want a more energy-dense diet, particularly higher in protein and fat. And so what you see is people turning towards livestock products as prosperity increases. People talk about the population crisis, and they mean the human population, but actually human population is one of the very few environmental metrics which is plateauing. It's dropped, the growth rate has dropped from 2% in the 1960s to under 1% today, and it's falling still very rapidly. There is a real population crisis. It's a livestock population. It's rising by 2.4% a year. But to put it in crude terms, by 2050, there'll be 100 million tonnes of extra human being on Earth and 400 million tonnes of extra livestock on Earth. Already it's the case that by weight, only 4% of mammals on Earth are wild. 36% is human being and 60% is livestock. And this is going to get a lot worse if we carry on on this trajectory, there will be nothing, out, nothing else left. They are eating us out of house and home to, to sustain this habit of, of eating animal products. Now, we can say you should all stop eating animal products. And yeah, veganism is slowly growing in countries like the UK, but not at anything like the rate required to reverse this really powerful trend. And it's as if we were to say to people, you should stop using fossil fuels but we don't suggest anything to put in their place. It's as if solar power didn't exist, wind power didn't exist, nuclear power didn't exist, but we just said stop stop using fossil fuels. How effective do you think that would be? So we also need technological substitutes. And fortunately, like the cavalry, non-animal based, um, uh, just as we need it most, the technological substitutes are beginning to arrive. And I'm particularly interested in precision fermentation. Now, um, for the past 12,000 years or so, we've concentrated on breeding and multiplying multicellular organisms, plants and animals. And we've pushed them to the limit and arguably beyond. You know, if you look at what we've done to the chicken, for instance, I'd say we've pushed it beyond its limits. And there's not much more in terms of efficiency that we can extract from these multicellular organisms. But we've scarcely begun to explore the food potential of unicellular organisms, these wonderful creatures with which we started this this discussion. And this potential is enormous because there's millions of species of microbes with extraordinary characteristics which can be multiplied up with a tiny fraction of the environmental impact uh, that is required to produce multicellular organisms. And precision fermentation is really just a refined form of brewing. It's just, it's just a more precise way of, of, of doing what we do when we make beer or make yeast for making bread or bacteria for injecting into cheese. But this is to uh, uh, multiply up very specific species, perhaps even particular breeds of those species, just like we do in other forms of farming, to create specific products. Now, plant-based substitutes for animal um, uh, products are generally pretty rubbish. And there's good reasons why they're pretty rubbish. It's that that plant proteins are low concentrations in the plant. The maximum is is 37% in soy. Um, um, That's as as much as you're going to get currently from from plant products. Um, Their profile is very different from animal proteins. And they're all tangled up in secondary metabolites, which the plants produce, which tend to have strong flavours, which are very un-meat-like. 
but a lot of microbial proteins are much closer to the profile of animal proteins. They are um, much, uh, much, in much higher concentrations, you know, in bacteria, it's 60, 65% protein, and much less processing and messing about is required to produce animal-like products from them. And if you were, for instance, to gene edit or gene modify those bacteria, you can directly produce um, um, amino acid profiles which are almost identical to animal proteins. Effectively, they are identical. Now, already we've seen some great technological leaps and bounds in the use of plant proteins. Um, I've recently eaten um, several meat substitutes which are very hard to distinguish from meat. But a lot of processing is required to get them there. But, they, you know, they've got the structure and things right. If you start using microbial proteins, you can radically reduce the processing required um, uh, while still using those new technologies which have been developed around plants. I'm especially interested in bacteria which eat hydrogen or methanol because they don't require any farm products at all. You can um, produce them anywhere on Earth which has got an energy source. In fact, many of the hungriest countries have got a great deal of one particular resource, which is sunlight. They might not have much fertile land, they might not have much water, but they have got the feedstock for this process, which is an energy source called sunlight, which can easily, easily be translated into hydrogen, which can then be translated into methanol, if that's the route you want. And methanol might be favourable because you don't have the phase transition between gas and liquid. You're you know, working from the outset in a liquid medium. Uh, but hydrogen has some advantages too. And you basically got bacteria which will feed on meth uh, hydrogen or methanol, use it as its energy source, much as a plant uses sunlight, but with a far more efficient process. And my estimates are that depending on your energy source, even taking your electricity generation into account, depending on the source, you can produce all the world's protein in an area the size of Greater London. I'm not suggesting we do it in Greater London. Um, it should be distributed, you know, and just as in the current food system, we should uh, um, put in place all the measures which we aren't currently putting in place in the current food system to prevent corporate concentration and dominance. Um, but this is a super efficient way of producing food. A tiny fraction of the land required, a tiny fraction of the water required, a tiny fraction of the fertiliser required, and no spillover because it's an enclosed system. And, and you can then produce the protein-rich and the fat-rich foods which people demand as they become richer, but without all the cruelty and the mass environmental destruction which goes with that. And so we have this amazing opportunity for change. We can make far more realistic healthier, cheaper substitutes for animal products, but we can also start making all sorts of things which no one ever envisages at the beginning of the process, just as the first people to capture a wild cow weren't thinking about camembert. Right? We have no idea where this could go. Once the innovative chefs get their hands in it, all sorts of extraordinary products and textures and flavours can, can begin to come out of it. So I think we're at a very exciting time. And this gives us the potential more than any other technology, any other environmental technology I believe in any field at all, with apologies to Moritz because he's doing brilliant stuff and as are many other people in this room with other also very, very important environmental technologies. But this one, in my mind, comes out at number one precision fermentation because it can do several very exciting things at the same time. One, massively reduces resources. Two, gives us the opportunity to restore ecosystems on a massive scale. And we've now reached the point where it's very hard to see us getting through this century unless we do that. Because not only do we need to try to stop the sixth great extinction in its tracks and, and the rewilding on a global scale is probably the only way in which we're going to do that. But we also need to draw down much of the carbon dioxide we've already released into the atmosphere. We've left it too late merely to decarbonise our economies. We also need to do that as quickly as possible. But even if we do so, we will certainly exceed 1.5 and almost certainly exceed two, 2 degrees of global heating. So we need to draw down some of the CO2 we've already released. The quickest, cheapest, most benign way of doing that is through ecological restoration. But there's also something else it can do, which it can break the disastrous import dependency which many nations are locked into, which depend on so much of their food or imports from thousands of miles away, 
which uh, is, is, is subject to the resilience of a global food system which is rapidly losing that resilience. And we're seeing more and more shocks transmitted across that system, which is why since 2015 global chronic hunger has been rising. We seem to be solving it. We seem to have cracked it until 2014. You know, from the 1960s to 2014, it was falling pretty steadily. And we thought we were going to meet SDG 2.1, you know, an end to hunger on Earth. And since 2015, it's been going the other way. Even while, for the first five years of that process, global food prices were historically low. But hunger was rising because of the transmission of shocks through a system which is losing its resilience, partly because of the, the extraordinary te te telemetry of that system, and these very, very long distances, oh, and, and the high extreme corporate concentration uh, of, of the, the channels through which that, that food is traded. And that lands, it doesn't hit us nearly so hard, but it lands particularly on poor nations with weak currencies. And if they can break that import dependency by being able to produce a very large part, the most important part, their protein-rich food, um, anywhere, uh, outside every town, there could be a, a, a microbrewery producing protein-rich foods for, for, for local markets. Then you've gone a long way to solving two massive problems at the same time. The, the, the consumption of the planet and the rising force of global hunger. So on that note, I think this is a great um, point in time where we open the floor to questions. Um, and if you want to ask about food, soil, that's great, but also anything in relation to that. And of course, George is well-versed in a whole lot of more topics. So Alice has a microphone, so if you raise your hands, please. And I should note that um, this is recorded and live streamed, so I hope you, you, you consent to being um, voiced online as well. Yes, question, please. Question there. Yeah. Thanks very much for the talk, George. It's quite a simple question. Um, what degree of optimism do you have that we'll do it all in time? Mm. Thank you. Well, of course, that, it, it, that is the crucial question. Um, and it, it's, it's, it, it so much depends, I think, on, uh, apart from anything else, on regulation. You know, the biggest barriers now to the uptake of these new foods are regulatory barriers. Not, not in every jurisdiction. You know, Singapore has pretty well opened the gates to all of it. And, you know, I should preface this by saying everything should be properly regulated. It should be properly tested. But, um, for instance, in the European Union, you've got a process which says that novel food approval should take place over two years, but it can be suspended at any time. And if they get bombarded with lobbying by the livestock lobby, for instance, you know, which sees this as a major threat, as indeed it should, then they'll throw out their hands and say, oh, it's just too complicated. Here in the UK, the Food Standards Agency is quite keen to, to start examining these cases, but it's just got a massive backlog, not least because it's been flooded with CBD applications, cannabidiol applications. And of course, it's got Brexit and it's got all the cut. Well, it's not, it hasn't been cut, but it has, its, its budget hasn't risen nearly as fast enough because of the extra workload from Brexit. And so it just doesn't have the institutional capacity to be processing this stuff. So what's really frustrating is a whole lot of this stuff is stuck in, in the pipeline, waiting uh, for, for regulatory approval. Because, it's, you know, it's perfectly safe. There's no reason, what, you know, we eat bacteria every day. You know, if you don't like eating bacteria, tough, your food is full of them, you know. Um, and, and there's no reason to assume there's any issue. But it should all be, you know, checked and tested properly, but not to the exclusion of allowing these, 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 these products to go. Then, then I think once um, they get approval, we're going to see several things happening at once. One of them is the S-curve. And I think there's very powerful reasons why we're likely to see S-curve adoption of these new technologies. There's two reports that point you to in particular, one by Synthesis Capital and the other by Rethink X, looking at sort of showing why we're likely to see a similar adoption to everything from the electric um, light bulb to the mobile phone, which is bumping along the bottom for quite a long time, not doing very much, 1% uptake, you know, it's sort of, you're slightly eccentric if you're, if you're eating this stuff, if you're engaging with this, and then it just gradually starts to tick up until it reaches about 10% penetration, and then it goes... 
just like that, straight away, almost universal uptake. And that's what's happened with technology after technology after technology, whether it's refrigerators or, or DVD players or whatever it happens, you know, you, you get this very rapid replacement of the old technologies with the new. And I think it could even be accelerated by social forces as well. You know, it's, it, because the S curve, you know, obviously is driven by social forces, but interacting with economic forces. But there's a further social force, which I think is very important, which is, is the techno-ethical shift. Um, and this has happened several times in human history where, where the development of a new technology enables a wider societal shift or accelerates a wider societal shift. So a classic case was the more or less simultaneous um, development of the printing press and the replacement of parchment with paper. Parchment, incidentally, was an animal-based product and paper today is a plant-based product. So um, we can see that as a similar sort of shift. But that sort of lifted the lid on political and religious revolutions, which are still reverberating today. You know, it enabled um, that latent desire for change to become an active um, um, a, a pressure for change. Similarly, with modern contraceptive technologies, gave, gave a massive boost to the cause of women's liberation. Obviously, still a very long way to go, but you know, they were a, a major accelerator. And the reason for this, I think, is that it's when something becomes amendable that it becomes intolerable. You know, the moment you say, but there's a different way of doing this. You know, we can have something better. We don't have to do it this way. Suddenly, there's a moment where we say, well, so why the hell are we doing it this way? Why are we killing 76 billion animals a year to feed us when we don't have to kill any animals at all? And have products which are just as good and cheaper. You know, why, what, and, and, and that's the moment where suddenly it's not just a sort of eccentric thing to be, to be a vegan. You know, it, it just becomes normalised very quickly indeed. So, so I think it could happen with tremendous speed, even despite the sort of generalised unwillingness to, to change, change diets. You know, people change diets very rapidly. We've all done so, uh, every society, really, over the past 50 years. But we've all, the whole time we were saying, well, I'm never going to change my diet. But we do. Great. There's another question here. Um, thank you for your talk. I think something in this discussion is a lot of these technologies that we're talking about are coming from institutions in the global north, and I'm just interested in what are the discussions that are being had with people living in the global south and, you know, with industrial lifestyles and our consumption, we've kind of come full circle and being, okay, vegan and plant-based. What does that mean for, like, cultural shifts as well and trying to have this as, like, a global movement? But there are huge differences, of course, with people's diets. Sure, thank you. Well, I mean, I'm, I can't claim to speak on behalf of anyone. I, I just say that, you know, I, I speak, um, you know, for myself and for what I would like to see. And and obviously, it, it's it has to be up to to people everywhere to make their own decisions about you know whether they approve of this or whether they want to participate in this or not. Um, I mean, what you know, what we're not talking about is any form of coercion. Um, any, any form of imposition here, uh, you know, we're, we're not talking about banning meat or banning um, uh, livestock production, um, but we're likely to see a technological shift which will happen at different paces in different parts, parts of the world. And where people find it works for them, you know, hopefully where people have what's called effective demand, in other words, they can actually decide what what they can eat because they have the economic choice to make that decision then you know hopefully people will freely be able to make whatever choice they they they, they w want to make um i think it does have huge liberating potential in countries which are hungry today but you know they have to decide whether they want to uh, um, exploit that potential or not for, for for themselves but you know my main concern because this is where the great majority of the damage is done is among rich consumer societies like ourselves you know we are the big eat meat eaters we each consume on average in this country 82 kilograms of meat per year which is roughly our body weight in the united states they consume 118 kilograms which is no no i won't go there um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's um i mean it is it is yeah, just a crazy amount of meat eating we're doing. The global average is, is 42 
uh, 43 kilograms, um, but it is heading our way because of Bennett's law, you know, it's driven that way. But in the very poor nations, it's much, much lower, much smaller, still rising in most nations, not all, um, but, but um, generally um, m much lower than ours. So, you know, my main thrust is to say, you know, we've got to deal with our own mess. We've got to sort ourselves out. We're in no position to talk to anyone else until we've done that. So there's one last question, and then I suggest there is more space to talk with George afterwards at the uh, reception. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, I mean, you did mention regulation, but could, could I perhaps sort of push a bit further as to what you might advocate? I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, we, we see governments looking at uh, carbon taxes, uh, carbon credits, uh, sugar taxes. I mean, would you advocate an animal protein tax as a way, again, of nudging particularly the, uh, the more affluent world, to make the sort of changes that you're advocating? Thank you. Well, I'd say a couple of things to that. Um, first of all, I, I don't think it will be necessary because I, I think, you know, if we are going to see an S-curve adoption, it really doesn't matter what sort of pricing mechanisms there are with meat. It's going to go. It's going to go down. It's going to be Kodak. It's going to be Blockbuster. Um, but... Um, but the other thing to say is actually there's something much more immediate you can do, which is to stop subsidising it. So um, worldwide, governments spend between $500 billion and $600 billion a year on subsidising agriculture. That's, that's, that's half a trillion dollars we're spending worldwide. Almost all of it is highly damaging spending, socially damaging and environmentally damaging. It's generally highly re re regressive form of public spending and it drives environmental destruction in all, almost all cases. Um, we believe, though it's hard to pin this down, but that over 50% of it is subsidising meat production. Now, there are many forms of meat production which would simply not exist without subsidies. Uh, that applies to, to the great majority of the ranching worldwide, certainly in this country, you know, the average uh, Welsh... Uh, sorry, uh, English upland sheep farm makes uh, minus 1,600 uh, pounds a year. Um, you know, it costs you money to get a sheep to market. Um, and, the, and what they're harvesting, the product being harvested is subsidies. You know, so, you know, what, when you sort of see all these lambing live programmes or country files, say, oh, I'm, you know, so I'm just taking the sheep to market and, you know, they will make the money. It's all completely irrelevant. All, all that is just ornamentation. You know, the, the money is made by filling out forms on the computer, but they don't want to show you that because it's not very glamorous. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, this whole sort of romantic image of, of, of the shepherd um, making his living from the land, you, they're not. They're just not making their living from the land at all. They're making their living from the taxpayer. And, you know, public money should be spent on public goods. And, and these, this, this is arguably the most harmful industry on earth. We should not be subsidising it. And I think that's a much easier political ask than taxation. You know, you're not taking anything away. Um, in fact, you're saying to people, you know, we're not going to use your money to be spending on landowners. But, I mean, that's what we're talking about, you know, because you get paid per hectare um, um, in the UK and the European Union. I mean, it's changing a bit with elms in the UK, but, you know, it's fundamentally, you know, the bigger you are, the more money you're going to make. Um, uh, you know, we, we're just going to be spending less of your money doing this. Um, and, and, and that would be just as effective as a meat tax. I mean, even, you know, so people say, well, intensive poultry, that's not being subsidised, but actually it is. It's a renewable heat incentive in this case that there's this total scam similar to the biogas thing we were talking about before, where um, poultry sheds are, are heated primarily with wood pellets in this country because there's this massive government incentive to heat them with wood pellets, which means that every poultry shed is responsible for the deforestation of about a hectare of woodland a year. Um, and that is mostly in Eastern Europe, where there's massive destruction of woods in Poland, in Lithuania, in, in Latvia, in Estonia, in Romania, in Bulgaria, driven by that demand for wood pellets for the renewable heat incentive. Um, and it's, it's just devastating. But those chicken sheds would not be economically viable if it weren't for that subsidy. It's not an agricultural subsidy, but it's still a state subsidy. So all those subsidies, we should just be stripping out. And, and if we did that, it, it would have a very powerful effect, which we'd see straight away. Well, thank you very much. I think we spanned a, a wide range of topics between microbes in the soil and taxation on, on meat.
But um, there's, of course, more, but I hope everyone learned just as much as I did. And if there's more questions, please stick around. George is here for the evening. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.